All right. Hello, everyone. It is good to see you. It is a few minutes after the hour, which means it's the perfect time to start in uh, MIT style. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this IFI colloquium. Uh, at the beginning, as you came in, you uh, may have noticed that there was a code of conduct up on the screen, as well as some information about today's talk. We, were, we uh, request that everyone uh, read that, uh, and hopefully you already did, and adhere to the code of conduct to make sure that everyone is treated fairly uh, during this colloquium. Uh, we are thrilled to have Professor Van Delt here. Uh, ben Van Delt is joining us uh, uh, today to tell us about his work on cosmology and AI. Broadly speaking, Professor Van Delt's research connects fundamental physics and cosmology with astronomical data on many scales ranging from the inner halos of galaxies to the largest scales accessible to observations. He is a Planck scientist and core team member of ESA's Planck mission, as well as a member of the Euclid mission. He's uh, the director of the Lagrange Institute in Paris and is also a senior research scientist at the Flatiron Institute. Uh, ben, it is wonderful to have you here today. We are excited to hear what you have to tell us. Uh, there are going to be questions coming in uh, in real time during YouTube that we will save for the end. And there will be questions at the end of your talk as well in, in real time from the audience. So if, uh, without further ado, we uh, welcome you, Ben, and ask that you please share your slides. Thank you, James, for this very kind introduction. Let's see if I can share the slides. Okay, great. Great, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and uh, let me just dive right in. I know this is a uh, intellectually diverse audience in terms of um, background, but uh, we're all united, I guess, by an interest in uh, using AI um, for, for physics. And so today we'll be on applications of um, what I think of as principled AI to cosmology. So. Uh, before I get started, uh, just to set the frame of mind, um, let me uh, talk about uh, the universe as a whole, as we can uh, observe it. So I'm showing here our past light cone, which is really the source of all the um, observations that we have um, in terms of uh, massless particles, it's like so photons or any, any other massless particles, gra uh, gravitational waves included. Um, and uh, so this really, this is the entire history of the universe and this represents everything we can observe. Uh, so on the right, I've given you a, um, a summarized timeline of the, uh, the cosmic past. And on the left, I've given you the kind of data sets uh, that trace cosmic structure um, as we look into the past uh, on, our, on, on the surface of the past that go from, from where all, um, all our observations reach us. So um, that includes uh, galaxies, um, includes the 21 centimeter uh, absorption, uh, lensing, um, the cosmic microwave background, um, uh, primordial gravitational waves uh, that uh, you know, some, some of these have not yet been observed, um, but most of these have been observed. And um, uh, the point is that uh, the data sets um, that, you know, that we have now and that we will have over the next decade are really beginning to cover significant fractions of this past light cone. So uh, that's the data object at some level, and this is what we're trying to understand. Uh, let me focus in on one aspect of this uh, that, that isn't actually on the surface of your past light cone, but is, that is of uh, intense interest nevertheless. Um, and that's the, um, that's the base of this. Well, actually the part of the base that's inside the past light cone. Um, and that is where the initial conditions of the universe live. Um, and since the light cone, there had to be a dimensionally reduced version. I couldn't uh, put the four-dimensional uh, thing there. Um, the disk that is at the base um, of, uh, of this light cone really is a solid ball, and I'm, I'm showing it to you here. Uh, in the middle here, I've marked for you the, uh, the beginning of the world line that ends up where you are now. And uh, so that, that traverses the middle of, the, of your past uh, light cone. Uh, and reaches you here at the tip, where uh, where we are now, here and now. 
And what I've shown on this in this 3D representation is a um, is an example realization of the um, uh, initial curvature perturbations in the metric uh, that source all the structure that we observe in the universe afterwards. So this is really this is the rolling of the dice. Um, you understand these as um, quantum fluctuations that having been created during a process of, of quantum fluctuations and imprinted on the metric. Um, at uh, at early times um, and physically, so these are curvature perturbations. Um, th these are akin to uh, potentials. So um, structures would then evolve in these gravitational potentials um, and uh, and and form over the, over history the his throughout the history of the universe. Um, I'm introducing introducing this here because I'll, I'll come back to this um, this image and then you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay, so uh, I made the point that we're actually uh, sampling this past light cone um, experimentally or observationally, um, and that's going exponentially fast. Um, I uh, didn't have the, uh, the, the ability <laughs> uh, or the skills to make a movie of uh, patches of this past light cone being filled in as a function of time. But if you made such a movie, um, it would uh, not, not look like much. And then uh, very quickly over the last few years, things would be growing. And if you projected it just a decade into the future, um, large swaths of this, um, of this past light cone would be covered. Uh, so growth, data growth in cosmology is exponentially fast. And uh, just as, a, as, a, as an indication with, with no, uh, no um, pretense of uh, being exhaustive, I'm, I've put up a few uh, a few experiments here that uh, that are covering this past light cone, from the you know, including the cosmic microwave background, galaxies, um, transients, etc. So here is uh, here we're back to uh, this set of initial conditions that uh, really, in terms of the you know, phases where the hot and cold spots of that are, where the potential wells, potential hills of that are, determine. Uh, how the structure forms in our realization of the universe. And uh, we have cosmological parameters that tell us about the statistical properties of these initial fluctuations um, and cosmological parameters that tell us about uh, the content of the universe and the dynamics of the universe. And, and with, with that and all of physics, we can then uh, forward model everything we observe in the current universe, all these complicated data sets that we, uh, that we obtain, um, all these tracers of that structure. Um, and uh, that is a large part of cosmology. That's, that's, um, that's, and we really are in this talk, we will be talking about thinking about this uh, entire problem of, of going from initial conditions and modeling everything that we observe uh, in the current universe, all the cosmologically relevant effects. And the cosmological inference problem is not this, but is almost this. Um, you just have to turn the, you just have to turn that arrow around, uh, and that's the cosmological inference problem. So once you've gone out there and you've covered the entire past light cone and all available frequencies, uh, with all available messengers, um, and uh, if uh, so once you have all of these observations, um, the idea is then to go back to understand. Uh, to understanding the initial conditions of the universe and understanding the uh, composition of the universe and the dynamics of the universe, um, the expansion history. And of course, uh, to some extent, uh, we have begun to do that. And, we, and to some things, we already have quite precise notions. Um, but we're still very far away from, from having used all of the information. And, um, and we are faced with, uh, with perplexing puzzles. Um, and uh, the hope is that once we get really precise, then uh, that, that, that will shed some light on some of these puzzles. So here, is, here are some of these puzzles. Here's what uh, we actually want to learn from this cosmological inference. We want to learn about um, the cosmic beginning. We want to learn about cosmic content. And we want to learn about cosmic fate. Um, so cosmic fate, because uh, the uh, expansion parameters that describe the way the universe has expanded um, uh, in the relative cosmic uh, recent history um, uh, are relevant to understanding dark energy and the dynamics of dark energy. Um, and 
Uh, and so that de determines what will happen um, in, with the universe in the future as well. Um, and so the cosmic beginning is related to these initial conditions, uh, the growth of perturbations and their dynamics uh, and the expansion geometry. Uh, all of these are tied into, into these, these three concepts that, I'm just, that uh, animate this, um, this research field. Um, okay, so what is, uh, how do we do this? Well, um, we, as uh, somehow we need to con confront all these data with our cosmological models. Um, and the way to do that, so here's a, a five point summary uh, for how to do Bayesian analysis, how to uh, use all of that information. Um, you, it's very simple. You just have to write down a full physical and stochastic model of the data given the set of parameters. Uh, you then get the data. Um, you stick the data into this likelihood. This likelihood here is the probability distribution of the data given a set of parameters. But uh, you stick the likelihood into that function, you then keep that fixed, and then you vary this combination of functions here. This is the prior, and you vary that combination as a function of the parameters. And that gives you the posterior, and that tells you what you now know about the parameters, including all of the uncertainties. Uh, so you specify the prior, write down this posterior, and then you explore this posterior of fixed data as a function of the parameters. So it's very simple. And you might ask, why haven't we done that? Well, you have done that just to some extent in some uh, particular, with some particular data sets. The difficulty uh, occurs when the data sets look like this. Um, so they're real uh, galaxies. Uh, that you don't look at the dark matter distribution. Uh, you even in the CMB, you don't see the CMB necessarily everywhere. You see CMB plus foregrounds, dust, uh, synchrotron, etc. All the everything that the uh, that our night uh, that our sky has to offer us. Um, and uh, so sometimes the data sets can be very complicated. Okay, so um, how do we proceed? Well, typically <clears throat> the way that we've proceeded has been in terms of um, the fo the following way. So instead of actually analyzing the raw data themselves, you go and you pick some summaries. A typical summary for spatial data sets in cosmology is, is the power spectrum for, for good reason. Um, once you've exhausted the power spectrum, you go to higher order endpoint functions. The bi spectrum is a prominent example. Um, counts uh, of, of objects, um, et cetera. And, um, then once you have picked some summary or some set of summaries, you then compute predictions for these sum summaries. So uh, in terms of perturbation theory, for example, uh, maybe numerical predictions through simulations um, and, and there are ways to, uh, to speed those up. So um, just emulation, et cetera. So you have some, some way of computing the physical predictions of these summaries in your cosmological model. And then you have to somehow confront these predicted summaries with the observed summaries. For that, you do need some kind of, you know, some statistics and um, because the true likelihood, so that true um, distribution of the data given the parameter can be very, very complicated. Um, uh, we hope that the summaries, because you know, juices with we appeal to the central limit theorem or have other arguments for saying that the summaries are uh, perhaps not that complicated. So we approximate the likelihood in some way. Often the obvious choice is just to say it's Gaussian. So the Gaussian with some mean and some variance that, uh, uh, that, that uh, depend on the parameters in some way. Um, so, that's the standard solution. And, and that has um, been very productive in multiple fields, subfields of cosmology. But um, this, this approach um, carries some risks and some inherent risks. So for example, um, what if the modeling um, is inadequate? Um, let's say uh, in perturbation theory, for example, uh, the linear regime uh, treats extreme ac you know, very accurately, but then we know that some in some regimes, especially as you push towards smaller scales um, in, in the density distribution, uh, we have nonlinear effects that are only partially coupled by, um, partially captured by, by low order perturbation theory. So there's been decades of development of advanced techniques for modeling uh, endpoint functions um, 
theoretically. Uh, ultimately, you go to simulations, uh, but you know, there's um, then you have to, even if you can capture the dark matter properly, there are all the effects of astrophysics, galaxy formation, all the ways the, the luminous tracers that that you observe, all the absorption features, whatever it may be, all the way that they relate to the underlying structure that you'd like to probe. And then you're not done, even if you were able to do that, you still have um, what. Uh, we refer to it as systematics. So those those are um, aspects that are you know maybe not that well understood, or um, um, or aspects of the uh, uh, you know of the data that uh, that you need to that are extraneous to the thing you actually want to measure uh, that you need to understand as well. Um, and then you have um, you have to actually model all the instrumental effects. So the fact that your instrument has an impact on the data. Um, so this is, uh, at some point you have to make some kind of a choice and um, uh, there is some risk associated with that. that is, this is typically called model risk in the financial world. Um, that's risk where you don't model all the way to the data uh, in a completely precise way. Then there's risk um, in terms of, or also model risk in terms of inadequate statistical approximations. So what if, the Gaussian form that you chose uh, doesn't actually model the tails very well. Often, uh, it's not that bad, but in, in some cases, especially when it comes to evaluating the, the um, severity of, of tensions, uh, then the, the exact shape of the tails uh, can be very important. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that uh, so, uh, because all the measures of tensions are directly related to uh, tails of the of the likelihoods and, and their shapes and asymptotics. And so um, inadequate approximations there can um, can be can have very important consequences. And then um, a, a more even more uh, fundamental risk is how do we know that uh, we've exhausted the information content in the data? Um, because um, we've chosen some summaries, but they may not. Actually, they may be say things that we have some idea uh, how to compute, but th but there may be other other things we could calculate from the data um, that might be even more informative. So, um, and again, uh, last few decades in cosmological research has been have been about uh, finding good summaries, so where good means that you know essentially some combination of these risks uh, is minimized in some sense. So um, let's start with the initial conditions. And let's, let's actually go to an example um, where we eliminate at least one of these risks. And I'm going to focus at first uh, on this last one about the summary. So what if we actually analyzed everything on, from the field itself? Um, so in order to do that, you would have to build a full explicit likelihood approach uh, that links these initial conditions, remember that ball with the initial curvature perturbations, links it uh, through a um, fully generative probabilistic forward model to the galaxies that you observe in your survey. Um, and we uh, call this Borg, so this is Bayesian origin reconstruction, so going back to the initial conditions from galaxies. And it also has this uh, allusion to the notion of incorporating uh, all of the information that, uh, that there is. Um, and what we have is, a, uh, what we assume there's a Gaussian prior for the initial pertur perturbations, which is, uh, which, uh, for which there's good um, both theoretical and experimental support, um, uh, observational support. Then we have gravity in our model. So not just linear uh, theory, but actually um, gravitational evolution from the initial conditions. And then um, once we have a final nonlinearly evolved um, uh, density field, we then uh, relate that to, to numbers of galaxies that might be observed at some point uh, in, the you know, in the universe, some direction in the sky at some redshift, uh, in a redshift survey uh, through a likelihood that is explicit. Um, and, and I mentioned a few things about what we put in because you also need to observe, model the observations for a particular survey, the selection function, the mask, uh, this noise calibration, a number of, number of things, bias model, et cetera. Um, then you have the problem of x -ray So now we have, in principle, we now have this posterior through having specified this model. Now we need to explore the parameters, but 
the number of parameters has now gone up. It's not the handful or you know, maybe up to 10 parameters that I mentioned to you in the beginning. It's the full set of all possible density values in all possible places on the basis of your, of your light cone there. Um, and that's a very large number for, for if it, you have a chunk of a volume of whether that's covered by the survey and you want to know what the uh, initial conditions were like in that chunk. And so we have, um, we explore a, a very high dimensional posterior with uh, tens of millions of parameters. Um, and, and this is, you know, once you've solved all the technical problems involved uh, and you fast forward about almost a decade from when we started this, uh, you get to the following. You have um, a set of observations, um, you stick it into the machinery um, and that machinery then generates a set of sets of initial conditions that are consistent with the fixed galaxy positions on the sky where you see them today. Um, and in fact, because you have these initial conditions and, this, and the dynamics and, and the likelihood, you can actually forward simulate. Um, so, so it's actually a set of histories that are consistent with the snapshots that we see when we look on our past light cone. And because the data are imperfect, that set of histories uh, is not just a single one, but um, but actually a whole a whole set. And the Markov chain explores all the possible initial conditions, all the possible histories of how structure formed in our universe, um, uh, given the data that we put in. Um, okay, so here's here's an example of that. This movie explores that set of histories. So here on the right, this is from this, um, this is uh, from a slice. Uh, of the Sloan survey. Um, we sit here at this corner, look at, looking out into the universe. This is a 3D survey, but I'm just showing you a slice here. Um, the analysis is done using the entire data set. Um, and uh, this movie here explores um, initial conditions and final conditions and all the steps in between that fit uh, to these observations. And you see that um, in these, in the slice, there's some hints of filaments, etc., cosmic web, and you see that you get extremely um, good uh, reconstructions of the cosmic web um, in the regions covered by the survey. And then there are regions out here that are not covered by the survey, and they're reconstructed uh, in a way that um, you know seems statistically plausible because the model is so um, you know, the model model includes them, gravitational collapse of initial conditions. Um, but they fluctuate a lot because there's very there's not much data there. Um, but here, where there is data, you get very stable uh, information, and it's a bit more, more difficult to see. But even in these initial conditions, uh, in this regime here, there are there are hot, you know there are high density low density regions that are uh, extremely stable. So there's a set of papers here, and if you're interested in this and you want to you want to Look at what's happening today uh, in, in with using these tools. There's the Equilla Consortium website that you can check out. Um, and so this uses uh, this from the gravity model. This uses um, we now use a, a PM code, uh, particle mesh code. So this has uh, gotten um, quite sophisticated. And you get things like uh, because you have these full histories and all the dynamics of everything that's happening from the observation of where galaxies are today. You actually get for example, their um, velocities you know, in Lambda CDM universe with, uh, with the physics that we put in, we can predict what the velocities of these galaxies are. And here we see, for example, in this middle part, uh, we see <clears throat> how uh, galaxies are streaming onto the uh, Sloan Great Wall. Um, this is the radial velocity, blue towards us, red away from us. Okay. Um, and you know, that, that you can then use for many other things. So for example, we can uh, de-bias H0 measurements from standard sirens, um, you know, because we, we know the, velocity, the streaming velocities of, uh, of the galaxies that, that harbor them um, and, and, uh, and other things. So is that it? Are we done? Problem solved? Borg, Borg is the solution to all problems? Well, no. Uh, it turns out the main problem is that the statistical power uh, even of the current data, even of these data sets that, we use, that, we've shown, that I've shown you there and the ones that we've tried this on, uh, are enormous. I mean, is, is enormous. The statistical power is, is, is very uh, high, meaning that, um, that we can only get good information about the cosmological parameters if we have an extremely realistic data model. And 
So what we need is a more realistic data model. Um, and then the, a better ability to project out, cut, mask the data in, in a way that make us less sensitive to the remaining model error. Uh, if we want to get to percent precision on, on some of these parameters, for example. And then we want to, in addition, build in robustness to model misspecification or residual model error uh, in a way that is flexible but respects certain physical principles. So uh, let me show you an example of that um, in, in a minute. But um, the point is that at this point, uh, we're getting to machine learning. So some, in some sense, what I've told you about is already machine learning because we've talked about Bayesian representations of what we know um, in a quantitative way about the history of the universe. But uh, now we want to go to what people more classic. There was a lot of physics in there. So you might be forgiven for thinking that it's not really machine learning, but maybe really simulation-based learning or something like that. It's very physics-based. Um, I will now, from now on, I'll talk about what I think as principled use of, of physics-based machine learning that, uh, that can, can help us in connecting physical models to data with much more precision and much more accuracy. So uh, as an example, in the context of Borg, since I've just been talking about that, um, uh, what do we call neural physical engines? So these are neural networks that encode um, approximately relevant physical symmetries. So translation invariants, it's because they're convolutional, but also local rotational invariants of the physics and locality in terms of the architecture and in terms of what kinds of kernels are allowed in these, in these networks. Imposing these symmetries reduces the number of parameters for these networks um, massively. So in this particular case, we have a neural network that has um, only 17 parameters, just 17 parameters. And um, so we can use it in the Borg framework. So we still have the gravity model. We still have all the explicit likelihood and everything. But we now put it in between the dark matter model, the gravity model, and um, where we put the data. So in this particular case, we use it to model uh, simulated halos based on the dark matter of simulation. Um, but based on a sort of smooth um, particle mesh code result. So we need to link these halos, these highly biased halos to the dark matter. And we use the 17 parameters in this neural network as just add them to the parameters uh, that we're learning. This is interesting because it turns out we're not really training the network just by having chosen the, the architecture. Um, we already, um, that, that's essentially enough. Uh, and then we're just using the data, which are right by definition, um, to uh, and, and the network to train the network as part of learning the 17 parameters. And at the same time, we're also learning about uh, uh, the, the dark matter. So let me show you how this works, what, what's, what's happening there. So here um, I'm showing you at first, uh, well, this is the simulated data. This is the halo distribution, a very discrete set of data. Here's the dark matter reconstruction. Initially, you see there's not much. This is at the origin, like the dark matter today, uh, reconstructed in this model. And then here is the predicted halo distribution based on, these, on this neural network. So the neural network basically takes this and, and tries to predict this. Um, and, uh, and then our machinery tries to predict dark matter distributions that when the network is applied, um, gives, gives this. Uh, and then and what's shown here is, the, uh, is the, the, basically the predicted mass function of halos given an underlying dark matter density in the cell. And you see that as um, this uh, Markov chain, now is this is a truly Bayesian neural network, varying the network parameters in the Markov chain, and we're varying the initial conditions in the very high dimensional Markov chain. And you see that um, the architectural constraints of the network are sufficient to, so that, the, that uh, this inference engine can find solutions uh, that look very much like um, uh, dark matter, cosmic web, uh, sampled as halos, which then match the, uh, the halo distribution here. So this is uh, one example, a first example of how to use a hybrid um, machine learning and you know, with a lot of physics inside. Um, okay, so maybe this is too much, too fast. I went for the uh, full problem right away. Let's take a step back and focus on you know, relaxing this problem a little bit uh, and um, just looking at geometric tests 
because they are um, inherently robust to, to um, um, certain kinds of model misspecification. This means you don't have to model the data completely. So can we take a geometrical approach? Um, that it turns out that uh, decouples the, the model for how the galaxies, etc., relate to the underlying dark matter from the cosmological parameters. Uh, the cosmological parameters now are only those that um, determine the uh, expansion history of the universe. The other ones you can't get in this way, but at least those you can get without making any further assumptions. And it turns out that you get an Alko Pichinsky like test except that it's a generalized version of it because it's not just based on two point correlations, but it's based on the entire field. So it's basically just, it's a, in some sense, you can think of it as an Alko Pachinsky test for all endpoint functions simultaneously. So it's not, that's not the way it's implemented, but, um, and so the, the, the point is that um, the galaxies observed are uh, observed in the redshift space and uh, that they are, isotropic and homogeneous in co-moving space. And so that transformation, if you can learn that the parameters of that transformation, which are the cosmological parameters, then uh, you, uh, you gain that cosmological information. And if you have a poor model for the clustering, then that'll just make the error bounds larger, but it doesn't, it's not going to, um, it's not going to bias your parameters. And uh, it turns out when you do that and use really all the information in the full field and not just in, um, in summary statistics, you get a, a extremely precise uh, and, and, and um, accurate, turns out, measurement for, for the simulation in this case uh, for these expansion parameters, uh, which if you run an, a VAO constraint on, on the same data set, um, uh, give you, you know, give you an idea for how much information uh, you gain by going really to a field-based approach uh, rather than focusing on a particular scale in the power spectrum. And as advertised, you do get a decoupling of the cosmological parameters here with all the bias parameters in the model, which, uh, which are shown here. So this is the covariance matrix, the posterior covariance matrix of those. And you see that they don't couple between these blocks. Um, Okay, so uh, that was just an interlude. Let's go back to solving the full problem. Um, remember how to do science the Bayesian way. Explain to you why this was hard. Uh, what if, I said, what if the data are, uh, you know, complicated? Um, well, in that case, maybe we don't know what the likelihood is. We don't know how to write it down. But uh, we may be able to, um, to make progress nevertheless. So. When we do this full problem, uh, we need more freedom than the traditional likelihood approach can provide. We want the freedom to make our physical model anything we want, I mean, uh, not, be, not be limited by the ability to write down the likelihood. We want the freedom to project, summarize, cut, mask our data in any way we want. So not just in real space or in Fourier space or in some other space, uh, but some uh, custom cut that um, can mask those parts of the data, those aspects of the data that we don't, um, that we're not confident in, in being able to model. Um, and that, of course, complicates, if you do that, complicates the likelihood uh, greatly, especially when you do it in a nonlinear way. If you discover things that don't work well in your, in your data model and then change it after the fact, this kind of a posteriori choices typically are very problematic. Um, and there's a long story there for you know whether you know, what is currently done done about them um, uh, that I'd love to discuss but don't have the time for. Um, and uh, but we want but it turns out that if you simulate data, it's much easier um, to do that. It's just adding those cuts in your code, uh, just like you do when you actually analyze the data or when you reduce the data. Um, it's, it turns out that's much easier than deriving a full likelihood and allows you to go beyond Gaussian likelihood approximations, for example. Um, so the, it seems then the holy grail would be to be able to say that if I can simulate data, I can analyze it. If, that, if we got to that point, then we would have made progress compared to where we are now. Um, well, simulations, are nothing other than draws from the likelihood. So if you have um, 
if you have a if you have your likelihood here, um, given some parameters, you, it, the likelihood tells you how you would generate data from that set of parameters. Uh, and so that's what simulation is. And so, uh, with a um, set of, uh, of fearless collaborators, uh, we've embarked on this project of um, building simulation-based or likelihood-free inference. And actually, we like to call this implicit likelihood methods for analyzing cosmological data. Here's a primer for how to, uh, how to think about this. So imagine that you have some parameters that you've drawn from a prior. So you start with some prior, could be uninformative, with maybe some physical bounds. Um, you draw a simulation from that set of parameters. You then, let's say, um, that to simulate the data from that simulation, you extract some data using whatever um, simulator you have for your experimental process, observational process. And then you compare the data, simulated data to the true data. And let's say you accept if they're exactly the same, or maybe within some small slack of epsilon. Um, and if you, and then you just retain, only if you accept, meaning only when the simulated data are basically equal to the true data, do you uh, retain the parameters that you use to draw them? So that's really, it's a very intuitive way for what Bayesian analysis means, because really a Bayesian analysis says, uh, gives you a this probability distribution over the parameters that could have given risen to could have given rise to your observed data. Okay, so here it's very explicit. You generate from your prior with your parameters, you simulate the data. If those simulated data are the same as your actual data, then obviously those actual data could have arisen from these parameters. Therefore, you accept uh, those parameters. If you do that many times and you let the epsilon go to zero. Um, then the retained set of parameters are actually good draws from the posterior PDF, which is what you wanted in the beginning. Okay, so this is not a particularly practical approach, as you can imagine. If you have uh, a billion galaxies, or even just 10 million galaxies, um, if you want all of the galaxies in your simulation to end up exactly in the same positions as the ones in your, in your survey, uh, you're going to be simulating for a very long time. Um, so you need to somehow dimensionally reduce the data space. So we're going to be back at summaries again, but, uh, but there's a little twist to it that we'll get to. So it turns out that uh, there are ways to compress um, data that, that are lossless as far as the parameters are concerned for your model. Okay? So it turns out you can take, for n parameters, you can make a very large amount of data, which you can then um, maybe pre-compress in whatever summary of statistics you want. You take all the summary of statistics, pi spectrum, power spectrum, everything you like. And then it turns out you can then further compress those into a number of massively compressed informative statistics where n uh, here is little n, which is the same as the number of parameters you started. So that means you can always compress your data into, into a small number of quantities that are fully informative about your underlying parameters. And this is discussed. This is um, score compression, which, which is, uh, has been known in statistics for quite a while. And this is discussed in the cosmological context in these, in these papers, astrophysics context. Um, so let's say we've solved that problem by doing these kinds of uh, extreme um, but very informative compression um, using those techniques. So then we still need to explore the parameter space somehow. And remember, we didn't want to put a Gaussian likelihood approximation, even in terms of these highly compressed, probably very informative parameters. So how, what do we do? Um, again, machine learning comes to the rescue. Uh, it turns out we can learn the likelihood directly from the simulations. Um, and uh, this is described in this paper here, um, the first version of this um, that, we, that we did now three years ago. Uh, and it turns out it works extremely well. In fact, it turns out to be faster than uh, what you do if you, in cases where you actually know what the likelihood is, uh, it turns out to be much faster to implement than uh, your traditional MCMC analysis. This uses, uh, this particular version here uses normalizing flows as a way to represent the likelihoods. You learn the likelihoods from the forward simulations, and then you, <clears throat> and then you cut uh, these through at, at, the, at, at the data that are actually observed, and then you, um, you visualize them. Uh, so 
A density estimation likelihood for inference has a number of uh, other uh, recent developments. It turns out you can harden these compression techniques against nuisance parameters so that the number of parameters doesn't explode because you have a bunch of things you don't know about your uh, about your process. As long as you know that it's there, you can harden these uh, compressions up, compress summaries. Uh, so it's still just the number of interesting parameters. Um, and uh, we have these neural density estimators that allow you to fit the likelihood described in this paper uh, and some algorithm for reducing the number of simulations you need to run. Okay. So, but uh, I already alluded to the fact that, um, well, what, what if you don't know how to compute informative summaries of your data? Um, what if, you, if these summaries are, um, you know, the power spectrum, even if you have a large set, maybe you still, you've still forgotten something. Well, again, it turns out machine learning can come to the rescue. Um, and in, in this paper, we describe uh, what we call information maximizing neural networks. And to cut a long story short, it turns out that these are ways of computing this, these score compressions without actually knowing what the likelihood is. If you've ever um, taken an intro course to statistics, asymptotic statistics, and, and this has been discussed in many um, influential papers in cosmology, including by Max Techmark um, many years ago, uh, these, these notions of uh, compressing data. It turns out that you always needed to know what the likelihood was in order to uh, get this compression. Um, and, but uh, it, it, um, it, so what this paper shows is that you can write down a, an optimization problem uh, based only on forward simulations that will, com that com will compute optimally informative, um, maximally informative uh, summaries without actually having when the underlying likelihood of the data are unknown. So this is, um, this is how this works. Uh, the likelihood is defined through these forward simulations and then you feed the forward simulations through a network that produces a summary for you and you feed the simulations through at a fiducial set of parameters. And uh, this network essentially computes for you the Fisher information uh, for the parameters of your model of the data set, even if you don't know the likelihood. And it does that by uh, minimizing this information loss here. Um, and the code for, do for doing that is, is publicly available. Um, it turns out there's a proof that's not in the paper, uh, but that's uh, being heard, I'm writing up now. Um, that this is for one parameter here uh, that shows that when you minimize this information loss, um, you actually get the score um, of the unknown original data likelihood. It turns out that, uh, so, uh, yeah. So really the computing a Fisher matrix or computing the score is, uh, has been turned now into an optimization problem with a bunch of with a neural computational uh, in a neural computational framework uh, based on a bunch of forward simulations at a particular point, fiducial point in parameter space. Uh, there are several applications of this um, I want to go through quickly. Here's one uh, for lensing. So um, this is using uh, uh, multiple spherical shells of correlated shear simulations with a Euclid-like mask and noise that are going through two levels of compression. One is to the power spectrum and then uh, massively compressed using, uh, using this information uh, maximizing neural networks. And it turns out that you can do inference. This is with a non-Gaussian lensing potential. So this uses, uh, this um, is enabled by this likelihood for inference and, and these compression um, techniques and some related work that was done um, at Harvard uh, recently. So um, now uh, let's go to the field. Okay, let's uh, rather than pre-compressing to power spectra, we want to get away from that. But let's go to the field. Here is um, a demonstration that this uh, technique recovers the full information directly from the Gaussian field. So just putting in the entire field uh, simulation that's shown here. Shown here, turns out you can get uh, posterior. Um, contours that are exactly correct. This is a case where we know what uh, we should get and we do get it. Uh, and you can see this because for this case, we understand everything. We can compute the theoretical information bound, the Kramer-Rao bound and see as we train this neural network, how this information bound is approached. And it's described in this uh, paper here. 
So this is quite fast, just 11 minutes on one GPU. Um, and then for multiple realizations of this field, um, we, it turns out that, uh, and this is actually, you can do this for non-Gaussian fields as well. This is for a log normal model, so closer to the cosmological case. Um, and you can then uh, stick those fields into the neural network, produce these summaries, and then learn the likelihoods using uh, density estimation likelihood for inference. And if you want to actually go through this process and see what it's like, this is available as an interactive tutorial um, at this compressed uh, uh, link. Um, so you, and there are a couple of ways that this posterior is explored here. In fact, this is an old plot. The contours have shrunk in the meantime um, because we trained a little bit longer. And there was a slight bug actually in that uh, preliminary plot here. Uh, but check out the paper and you get the most recent version. Okay. Um, so uh, this has not just been done with these kind of synthetic uh, data sets where we know what we should get, okay? But we also have done this, um, uh, we've done this kind of compression ideas and likelihood free inference now in the context of 21 centimeter light cones uh, with uh, um, Yimao and uh, students and collaborators uh, in, in Beijing. And this is from the reionization, epoch of reionization. So these are light cones. Um, and it turns out we can infer gas parameters, these astrophysical parameters of the, of the hydrogen um, uh, in these models uh, using those techniques. Here, the compression is not done using these information maximizing neural networks, but it's done using uh, networks that were trained to guess the parameter values. The point is that Using these techniques, we can get the full uncertainty quantification as well in terms of getting to the posterior contours. And it turns out that when you're doing this using just on, based on the power spectrum, you underestimate the uncertainty and you get, or just get the posterior contours um, wrong. All right, so uh, it turns out there's an even simpler way to do it, but it requires a bit more trust in the machine learning. It turns out that the, all the stuff that I've told you about up to this point can only fail uh, in the sense that it might not give you optimal results if the machine doesn't learn completely. Um, now we're going to uh, trust the machine a little bit more and uh, go directly from the data to posterior. So we have uh, networks that we call moment networks or posterior marginal networks, two different types of approaches that are trained on the data uh, to give you, you know, the particular losses. So you choose these uh, quadratic and quartic loss, for example, to, to, um, so the networks learn to give you the posterior mean or the posterior variance for every single parameter. Or you can use this kind of KL loss, uh, but only on a low dimensional posterior subspace uh, to uh, directly return to you um, two dimensional marginal posteriors, uh, which is typically what you put in a paper in any case. So you, serve, so you solve the curse of dimensionality of having to, for, if you have many parameters, to ha of having to learn a high dimensional posterior surface. And you just learn projections, basically. Um, lower dimensional projections that, that are typically the only objects you can really handle in practice in any case. So this is described in this NeurIPS um, paper. Uh, here are examples, let me skip this one. Um, this is these are examples based on uh, gravitational wave simulations uh, from uh, binary black hole mergers. Uh, going up in the number of parameters to 100,000 parameters, uh, where every single pixel here now suddenly is a parameter. Uh, we applied this to CMB foreground cleaning. This was just a, uh, this is actually uh, just a test that isn't in any paper. It's just for temperature simulations obscured with a non-Gaussian foreground model. It turns out you can reconstruct the underlying temperature uh, and you get the posterior variance in a way that is very, very plausible. Basically where you have a lot of foregrounds, you get a lot of variance. That doesn't happen actually when you use, um, when you assume Gaussianity of the foreground models, as many methods do. And here is uh, something that's just been submitted uh, to the journal, will appear in the archive shortly. It's a um, BEEP, it's applied the same technique applied to polarization data now. And this is for a true B field contaminated with foregrounds. Um, the foregrounds are from, from a, a single image, a single foreground image. It turns out using wavelet phase harmonic generation, we can produce uh, many um, examples based on a single, uh, single um, training image. 
use that to train the network. And then uh, for a random generation, gen randomly generated uh, data set, recover a, an optimal estimate of the posterior mean of each pixel and the posterior um, variance. And how do we know that this actually works? So this is now again happening in hundred, with hundreds of thousands of parameters. We can now check whether um, the mean and variance are, are you know, work. We can do sort of a quantile test uh, by, by dividing um, the errors of the true fields that we know for these simulations uh, uh, by the, you know, divide, set, um, computing the difference to the predicted mean and dividing by the variance. And it turns out we get uh, extremely good results. So this seems to be working, working very well. Okay, so now in the last few minutes, how much time do I have? Um, in the last few minutes, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, really approaching this full cosmological inference problem that, that I sketched uh, initially. So we've kind of gone through uh, initial attempts using still explicit likelihood and talked about simulation-based likelihood, uh, compression techniques, ways of modeling the likelihood using machine learning, um, and direct approaches that just go straight to the answer from a data set. Um, it turns out that these direct approaches have, can, can, that we actually have some um, applications of those for, uh, to much more complicated data sets now. Um, and in particular, uh, in the context of the CAMELS project, um, which are large, large suites of full uh, cosmological hydro simulations um, using leading codes like Lustrous TNG and Simba. Uh, so, uh, if you want to do this, it turns out you now can actually, you don't need to do these simulations because we've made them publicly available. So these, uh, this project led by uh, Paco Villascuza no, Navarro, Shai Bienel and uh, Daniel Angles Alcazar. Um, we've now uh, released a thousand uh, illustrious simulations, a thousand Simba simulations and 2000 N-body simulations that are matched to these. And uh, the paper, very recent paper uh, that describes them is this. And there's a website where the data set that was released um, uh, is, is described and documented. And here's just some simulations of slices through these uh, hydro simulations for different cosmological parameters and for, uh, for parameters uh, that, that parameterize the feedback in these hydro simulations. And these, uh, there are 13 fields. 13 fields are uh, shown here, all these different hydro outputs, um, plus also an n-body output. And there's a case where we actually include all the um, 11 of the hydro outputs that are not related, not the n, not uh, the n-body or dark matter velocity, not the not the um, n, not the dark matter uh, velocity or density rather. Um, and these are small scale simulations for in terms of cosmo cosmology, I mean, 25 megaparsec. Um, and uh, so you, we go down to 100 kiloparsec resolution in these images. And so now we want to see whether we can, whether there is cosmological information in any of these fields uh, and whether we can extract it. And it turns out we can. So I'm showing you a couple of examples, randomly picked. Here's what we get from the gas temperature. And it turns out uh, the training loss for our network that's uh, doing the inference is exactly this um, a training loss, the slight modification of the training loss uh, in the moment network paper. So it's just a log combination of a quartic loss, the same quartic loss and, and, then, um, and the squared loss. So the posterior means and variances are computed using moment networks trained on the CAMEL simulations. Um, and you see that uh, the common simulations can reproduce the cosmological parameters, even, even on these very small scales from just single slices of uh, a hydro simulation, 25 megaparsec squared. Um, and uh, it, for some, uh, for this particular case, from the gas temperature, some of the uh, hydro parameters are not relevant, so it doesn't get uh, reconstructions. But a uh, key thing is that uh, the means and variances here seem to, seem to be quite uh, consistent with what we know to be true in these simulations. Here's another one, here's gas metallicity, and even that has cosmological information. And uh, so the first, to summarize, I mean, there's there are now three papers, uh, the, the, the paper um, releasing the data set, and then two papers that make these three points uh, that are shown here at the bottom. Um, 
that we can, you know, we, we now have a cosmological AI that we can ask questions and that has taught us something. Uh, it has taught us that there is cosmological information on very small scales. When we smooth these, then we actually lose cosmological information. So um, that's maybe uh, a surprise. Um, it turns out that uh, if we just take, if we take 11, the 11 hydro outputs together, it turns out they contain more information than, than if we feed the dark matter densities uh, into the network. So uh, hydro doesn't just destroy information, it can actually um, add information, cosmological information. This is cosmological information. And in uh, the second paper there, uh, we make the point that uh, for some combinations, in particular for adding all the mass, the total matter, um, the inferences are robust to baryonic physics. So this is very good news for weak lensing. It doesn't prove anything, but it's very good indication it goes in the right direction. It turns out that uh, regardless of whether we model the, um, these observables um, using, using uh, illustrious TNG or Simba, uh, we can train a network on one set of simulations, apply it to the other set of simulations and still get unbiased results. Here's uh, an example of that. On the left is this train, you know, this cross uh, train, while well, the training, training on Simba and testing on Elastus TNG. So yeah, at the bottom, at the top, see what that you get. Maybe this is a very slight bias, but this, it's very small and uh, typically, you know, you get get you get it pretty much correct. Um, and here's the cross uh, set, let's see the green one uh, in the other direction. So you train a network on Illustrious and uh, apply it to Simba. Um, so this is good news. This, 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 so we have robust prediction from uh, the total mass that includes all gas mass, stellar mass, um, the dark matter, um, with all the hydro effects included. Um, and lest you think that this is because the Simulations look exactly the same. So they agree, maybe on you know in every way. No, actually, um, this is a one single same initial conditions um, in Elastus TNG and Simba. This is this is showing uh, gas temperature, and you can see that they are quite different. So the way that feedback is handled in these simulations is, is quite different, and they give quite different results. And nevertheless, the total mass uh, seems to give. Um, you know, total mass seems to be robust. Um, so that, and of course that is what lensing um, is sensitive to. Okay, um, and so in the very, in, know, to conclude basically, uh, I wanted to mention a few things about the simulation challenges because everything I've talked about here uses a lot of simulations. And so um, in the age of implicit likelihood inference where you're doing, you need to do all these simulations, how do we deal with those? Um, we've been thinking about ways of reducing variance, and getting more use out of each simulation um, by combining simulations with uh, fast guesses, essentially, that we call surrogates. So here's an example of predicting uh, the power spectrum, nonlinear power spectrum, using uh, full n-body simulations and just a few, uh, and um, so combined with, uh, or compared with just a just very few n-body simulations, but paired with uh, um, a lot of fast, uh, in this particular case, uh, Kohler uh, surrogates. So these are using perturbation theory um, and a few time steps of of a particle mesh code. And it turns out that uh, you see here the you know, error bars due to 500 gadgets um, and the error bars from just five full gadget ones, but combined with a lot of these uh, cheap simulations, it turns out that the error bars of, of, of those are much smaller on some scales, but on, in the nonlinear regime are equals. So that, you know, basically you're saving a factor of 100 in terms of computational uh, cost because ga the gadget simulations are much more costly than these um, Kohler ones. But this could be neural generators. Uh, it turns out that um, these are guaranteed to be unbiased. So if your generator, if your fast uh, surrogate is uh, is biased, it doesn't matter as long as the errors, as long as the fluctuations are correlated. It turns out that the results from from this combination is always unbiased. This, uh, in the second paper, we've now applied it to covariance matrices as well. And it turns out that also gives very good results, a factor of 10 reduction in, in uh, error on the covariance matrix. Um, 
uh, sorry, it's a factor of 10 reduction in the number of simulations needed for comparable accuracy when you combine full end simulations with these surrogates. Uh, here's 100 without surrogates, and this is 100 with surrogates, and this is compared to 1,000 here. And these are the inverse covariance matrices that are relevant for um, parameter estimation, for example. So you can think of this uh, without wanting to go into a great amount of detail, but uh, this gives you a way of, of thinking about sort of almost um, um, a non-perturbative uh, statistical approach to perturbation theory. So if you have a numerical model that's maybe very heavy for a particular uh, case, and you then want to compute a related case, you already have a thousand simulations or some uh, set of simulations at the uh, previous um, parameter point, Let's say, um, yeah, and you want to, uh, and you don't want to rerun another thousand simulations because it's extremely uh, uh, costly. You can use the thousand you already have as a surrogate because they're cheap now because you've already run them, and then just run a few at the displaced point uh, to re and and use the existing ones to reduce the variance. So. Um, Okay, and just as a few goodies at the end, uh, it turns out you can, uh, there are other things that we've done recently to parallelizing n-body simulations um, completely. So per making perfectly parallel n-body simulations. Uh, we've uh, published again with, led by Paco, um, large suites of n-body simulations that can be used to train n-body surrogates, for example, n-body generators, uh, understand, and understand n-body statistics. We've looked at super resolution ideas so that given a bunch of embodied simulations, you can then go deeper and get uh, predictions of high resolution um, fields. And that's my, those are my conclusions. So we'll be a, a wash in data, uh, but we now have uh, a great many uh, very powerful tools to uh, address these problems using these implicit likelihood techniques and machine learning. Thank you. Um, I can't hear anyone. I think you're muted. In case you are speaking, James. Very good. Sorry, I didn't have permission to unmute myself, and now I do. So <laughs> wonderful. Uh, thank you for uh, the patience as we did that. Uh, that was a wonderful talk, Ben. Uh, I'm sure there's a number of questions. There's already one in the chat by Artan, but maybe I'll ask him to unmute himself and uh, uh, to raise his hand, and Marissa can unmute him, and then he can uh, he can ask it in real time. So I don't know how to raise my hand, though. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you for great talk. So I have a question. So you start from these Gaussian distributions, and then you have certain finitely many history data, and you would like to start from homogeneous or single mode distribution like a Gaussian distribution, and then flow this distribution eventually end up with probably multimodal distribution. So let's say you're trying to make an estimate of the density of the dark matter in this space. Um, so often there is this issue using neural networks um, to do this. Um, right. Let's say I'm, I'm so actually- can, can I just quickly, because I just so we don't uh, so, um, misunderstand each other. This particular case, we start with the Gaussian initial condition set of conditions because that is actually um, a prediction of a large set of, um, of um, theoretical models for the initial conditions of the universe. Mm -hmm. And then we have a physical model in that part of the talk. I think when you ask the question, we have a physical model for um, predicting how that Gaussian, those Gaussian, the Gaussian field um, mm -hmm then turns into a, this kind of cosmic web type structure that, mm -hmm. uh, that we understand the universe to have today. Um, yes, yeah, so, but that's very deterministic. That that's is defined deterministic. by a set of rules. How do you make the machine learn that? As you right. use machine learning. So uh, it, we just, in that particular case, we just wrote down explicitly a Bayesian hierarchical model. Um, we have a transformation that is, yes, it's deterministic, exactly. 
Um, what's not deterministic is the, is the likelihood at the end that says, okay, so if it's dense here, there's a galaxy going to be um, somewhere nearby, but or not, you know, with some probability, uh, or some number of galaxies in a particular voxel. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then essentially you can imagine, right, as we change the set of initial conditions, we can run uh, lots of simulations forward. And then it's just about a, ch a way of choosing the set of initial, choosing the initial conditions in such a way that um, you, you actually explore the correct measure over this set of initial conditions, um, which mm -hmm. corresponds to the posterior uh, in, in the initial con set of initial conditions given the data. And that we do, because, so that's a difficult problem because it's a very high dimensional uh, yeah. problem. Um, and uh, we use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to do that. Uh -huh. So um, we propose points based on solving fictitious, uh, uh, fictitious mechanics problems uh, that guarantee that uh, we get um, a nearly unity acceptance probability for a new set. Mm -hmm. so that, that involves having a differentiable um, forward model. So we've, I think we were the first people to write a differentiable um, gravitational n body code but it was differentiable in terms of the initial conditions. So uh, I I, yeah. nowadays you can do that if you, so there are uh, collaborators of mine, um, you know, for example, um, um, you know, at, at, the, at the Flatiron, uh, at the CCA, uh, Shirag Modi, for example, who uh, have implemented gravitational n body codes in TensorFlow. And since you're mm -hmm. inside, or now we're doing it in JAX. And since you're inside that environment, you then can use um, just automatic differentiation uh, to differentiate through the model. But uh, so, you know, eight years ago or something when we started this, um, we, uh, that doesn't, didn't exist. And so we actually wrote down a uh, hand-coded uh, forward, mm -hmm. forward differentiable. Um, so are you taking advantage of these generative models? Are we taking advantage of these generate, generative models? Uh, yes, uh, in the, so in multiple ways. So we've got physics-based generative models that mm -hmm. are also now built in, in sort of a TensorFlow environment, They're still solving the same physics. Uh -huh. But we also now have, um, but, but we also now have generative models. And so Shirley Ho at the, at the CCA has been uh, focusing on that in a number of Thank works uh, that, that actually generate, that learn the n-body dynamics just as sort of a single shot. So mm -hmm. the net that take, take you take in initial particle displacements, and then you correct these particle displacements to give you the full nonlinear output. Right. And that's also working very well. So yeah, I think my question was actually about this part. Okay. Nice, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a multi, number of different ways you can, uh, you can approach that, this problem. Exactly. There are other questions, so we should probably move on to other questioners. Th Artan, thank you for getting us started. Giorgio, I, Giorgios, I see your hand is raised. Yes, uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. I had a question on the carpool convergences the, yeah. on the last part. Mm -hmm. uh, other internal estimators claim to also be able to uh, give you an estimate of the covariance, such as the drag knife or bootstrap. So I was wondering if you have looked into how the performance of this carpool method compares against uh, those. Right. So uh, carpool gains its power from, from kind of a qualitatively different uh, aspect. Uh, so uh, drag knife estimators, bootstrap estimators, uh, tend to be a little bit better than uh, sort of the st straightforward sample variance estimators. Um, uh, but what we're adding here is the ability to uh, combine costly full simulations with cheap, fast, approximate simulations. Um, and then we use these cheap, fast, approximate simulations to cancel off variance, basically. Um, and we do that in a way that guarantees that we get unbiased results. Uh, yeah. So in, in some recent works, so, so there's other things you can do. You can do shrinkage for uh, covariance estimation uh, that also that gives you biased results, but uh, sometimes much lower variance. And uh, so in uh, work that is about to be submitted, we've now combined those. So we now have a Bayesian approach where we estimate the um, the mean and covariance of a set of simulation simulated quantities. To get together with a large set of fast sim but approximate simulated quantities. And because we can put a prior in that context, uh, it turns out that we can also um, 
essentially do shrinkage, which, which you can think in a Bayesian context, of, you can think of adding a prior. So you can put a very mild prior and then still, and then get strong variance reduction uh, from both of those. Yeah. Great, great, thank you, Dan. I guess okay. as a final comment, uh, all, the jackknife ha also has the disadvantage that you cut off part of your volume. That's, that's correct. You, you're doing but a, a single, small set of simulations, you then have to, you can't go full scale. That's right. Yeah, great, great. Uh, thanks a lot. Pleasure. Uh, so Prasant and then Nayantara. So Prasant, please ask your question. Um, you mentioned score-based data compression. Uh, yeah. So are these scores estimated at specific reference values for the parameters or uh, do you do it over multiple parameter values? Yeah, so yeah, that's an excellent question. So yes, um, because it's a score-based um, estimator, we, um, so these information maximizing neural networks are actually, you can train them at a single point in parameter space. Um, and they give you uh, compressed quantities that will be optimal in the vicinity of that point. They may be suboptimal elsewhere. So that, that is correct. And uh, feature of the, on the plots that I showed, showed you, there are actually uh, some, some uh, there are certain markings that I didn't explain. Um, and those, those showed what happens when you first train at a very distant fiducial model that's very far from the truth. So you get a slightly, you get a somewhat suboptimal compression at first, and uh, then you, you, but then you run with these uh, suboptimal compressed quantities, uh, you, and then you retrain once more, uh, you know, in in the patch that you uh, that you ended up in, and that then shrinks just does the the job of tightening up the contours at the end. Um, but yes, so that is different. So that can be advantage or disadvantage. If you, uh, if you already have a bunch of simulations that are spread over a, a large range of parameter space, then you can't reuse them for this purpose. Uh, I mean, but if you are able, if you have a bunch of runs that are all in a single place in parameter space, then, then this, is, uh, this is interesting. And, and there's the theoretical uh, aspect that I'm not aware of having seen elsewhere that you can, uh, just based on solving an, an optimization problem, you can find scores you and compute Fisher matrices uh, for unknown likelihoods. Um, uh, so something that might be interesting in this context is uh, instead of maximizing Fisher information, if you go after mutual information, for example, that's, right. yes. that's a way of just averaging out Fisher information over a larger parameter. Yeah, right, uh, exactly. Yeah, so that could be a way of, of um, Kind of making it not as you know have, have this asymptotic flavor of, uh, of of being near some point in parameter space. Um, that that's correct. Thanks for the excellent talk. Thanks. Thanks. Excellent, Nayantara. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I think I was just want, uh, curious about whether the tricks that you use to like sample a ten to the power seven parameter space with an HMC and Borg. Were they like tailored or unique to the cosmological simulation context? Um, or are they possibly something that could be used in other applications with like high dimensional sampling issues? Um, I, I think, um, so yes and no, <laughs> because we have, what you need is, I mean, they're tailored in the sense that you can only use HMC um, in cases where your forward model is fully differentiable. So you have to have a differentiable forward model. And uh, since this, this is physical dynamics, we do have a differentiable forward model. So you can differentiate the dynamics and then get, but, uh, but other than that, um, uh, not really. I think other, other than that, uh, I mean, you have to be careful about uh, propagation of, especially in high dimensional situations like this, you have to be careful about propagating numerical error and things like that. But, but uh, with some care, the same kind of approach should really work also. Uh, in other contexts, because HMC has this essentially has has a um, symmetry that protects the accept reject um, and and that uh, the symplectic symmetry of the dynamics that that uh, gives you uh, acceptable you know that gives you non-zero or effect non-infinitesimal uh, acceptance probabilities even in very high dimensional spaces. So it's really a qualitative difference from from what you would see with other sampling approaches. I see. So you're not explicitly imposing or 
one doesn't necessarily need to impose any conditions on like the isotropy of the field or no, like that. no, no, there's nothing like that. No. I see. Thanks so much. All right. Are there any last questions for Ben? We're already 15 minutes over, which means there was a lot of interest. Yeah. Uh, Prasant and Nayantara, your hands are both still up. I don't know if that means you have more questions or if you just haven't put them down. Um, then, um, you know what, actually, I, I, I'm gonna read the paper. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. We really appreciate it. And uh, we sure. uh, will put this on YouTube uh, quickly. And if you could send us your slides, that would also be great. We like to post them online to sort of maximize impact. Uh, and Very happy to. For those of us that are still here, uh, let's thank Ben one more time. And uh, everyone have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks. You too. And I only regret that uh, I couldn't be there in person, but... Um, uh, that's another that's just life these, these days but uh, we, I guess we'll get uh, get to a um, slightly more normal mode of operation uh, in the not too distant future I hope so that's right that's right <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very excited about this information maximizing neural network it sounds very cool and like it ha potentially has math applications that some friends and I could could potentially use for something so yeah, I'm, no, I'm definitely very happy to chat about it more yeah. I, I mean it, it seems there's lots of domains, even in pure math, where you have some complicated thing that you want to compute that is some very complicated function of, of, of some input, and, and you don't know what the right, you know, what the right, so, so to say, summary statistic is that really controls the output. Hmm. But there's some oh, large cool. pile of information that gets fed into some algorithm, and then something pops out, and the thing that you care about is the thing that pops out, but you don't really know what controls it at input. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like that's the sort of thing that these IMNNs might be able to help with. Our spaces aren't very continuous, though. That's part of the problem. But um, I'll, I'll read your paper and let you know if I have questions. Very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm happy to share these notes about. So the, there's the proof about um, sort of this universality of, of um, being able to compute the Fisher information for any process. Uh, that's not in the paper, um, so but I'm happy to share the notes. So, so that actually was one thing that I was going to to ask, but I, I didn't want to go too over with, with 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 time. If you do have time for one more question, um, my understanding of what you were talking about in these IMNNs is that you know of, of course you don't have the likelihood, but what you have is a way to compute or estimate the Fisher information so that you can have some compression that maximizes the Fisher information and in the process gives you a useful summary statistic automatically. Is that is that right? Uh, how, does, how does it work? That, that's correct, but that sort of seems circular because if you have a way to compute the Fisher information, yes. then you don't need this. <laughs> that's why I'm confused, yeah. yes. So no, so the interesting thing is that um, basically by intuition uh, in, this, in this paper, um, the guess was that we can just assume a Gaussian likelihood for the outputs of the, like, of the, uh, of the network mm -hmm. and then use the Gaussian form for, for the Fisher information. The idea being that um, there's sort of two parts to the intuition. One was that, um, one was that um, you know these are supposed to be informative uh, summaries. So um, asymptotically, they should tend towards Gaussian in terms of the statistics. Yes. And the other was that uh, if I think of the network as a universal function approximator, it should at least always be possible to transform whatever input into a set of outputs that has Gaussian statistics, um, but not required. So it was a little bit by, you know, by fiat that we that we tried this and it seemed to work very well. And it actually we observed after the fact that it seemed that uh, the outputs of the network tended to be Gaussian and were, you know, in cases where we knew what uh, what the optimal compression was, they tended to be functions of those that Gaussianized them. So it was kind of strange. Um, and and so then I uh, thought about it more and I realized that the optimization problem that we asked the network to solve, even though we is you know, even though we assumed this Gaussian uh, Fisher uh, information at the end, it turns out, um, it, you know, even with that assumption, the network will compute the score of the original unknown uh, likelihood. Yeah. I mean, there is this story about how even after training, there, there's this famous story about large N and Gaussian process in the neural network priors. But then there's also this story about preserving it under either Bayesian training or gradient descent with MSE loss. Mm -hmm. I, um, but, but but you're saying that that the 
this this was working because the assumption that the train networks were having outputs drawn from Gaussian actually seemed to not be that far from the truth, and so you were able to. We found that after the fact, it was it was yeah. sort of you know, we put in the assumption, we found that after effect, but it turns out in in retrospect uh, that um, one can prove that uh, that even assuming this Gaussian Fisher you know, Gaussian form of the network output. Yes. Uh, does it doesn't impose anything on uh, yes. on um, so still the network outputs the score of the uh, of the underlying of the underlying true likelihood. I see. But that is unknown. I see. And, and, and this, so in other words, you can actually think of these as a way to compute Fisher information for uh, cases where you can simulate, but you don't know the form of the underlying likelihood. And was this the thing that you said was not in the paper, or That's, that that part is not in the paper? No, but I, I actually on one of the slides I give a uh, I give a proof sketch. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be okay. Then I'll, I'll look at your slides and, and ask. Uh, thanks for the technical question and discussion at the end. Um, we're well over your time, and it's late. There, okay. so thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking your time in the evening. So. All right. Have a, have a wonderful day. Thanks.